Good morning and welcome everyone. It is eight o'clock. I uh, want to welcome everyone to our virtual Grand Rounds. I'll be turning the time over in just a moment to Dr. Wolfgang Baer for the introduction of our speaker today. Uh, just a couple of updates. Uh, we are virtual for the foreseeable future. Uh, we will uh, make an announcement if we are returning to in-person Grand Rounds and in-person educational events uh, at the end of the month. Uh, outside of that, I uh, wish and hope everyone is healthy. Please, uh, if you do have questions about the current protocol for if you test positive or have an exposure, uh, check out the link on Pulse. Uh, that's where you'll find the most updated recommendations. And given that it's been a bit of a moving target, I uh, well, recommend you check out the latest there. Uh, with that, uh, we'll turn the time over to you, Dr. Bear, for introduction. Okay. Good morning. I am very pleased to introduce Max Najuri, University of California in San, San Francisco. <clears throat> he received a PhD from UC Berkeley and University of Paris, Orsay in 2001. His topic, his thesis topic was in nuclear transport and mitotic spindle assembly. <clears throat> he took a postdoc position in 2007 with Peter Jackson at Stanford University and Genentech, where he started to work on primary cilia. Subsequently, he was assistant professor at the Department of Molecular and Cellular Microphysiology at Stanford University. And since 2017, he is associate and full professor Department of Ophthalmology, University of California, San Francisco. With his mentor, Peter Jackson at Genentech, he started working on the Bartlett Beetle syndrome, characterized by obesity, retinal degeneration, polydactyly, and polycystic kidneys. In the last 15 years, Max established, established himself as an expert in the baby's home, primary cilia, ciliogenesis, microtubules, and microtubule acetylation, and in the flagella transport. He has published a series of excellent papers in the last 20 years, topped by a recent solution of the native BB's home structure. Today, he will present a talk on the molecular basis of the modern beetles at home. Welcome, Max. We're happy to be here. Thank you, Wolfgang. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm very sad that uh, uh, we're not in person. Uh, I really was looking forward to my first trip in uh, whatever, 20 months uh, since the beginning of 2020. So I had that on my calendar as uh, something to look forward to, stepping on a plane and seeing people. Uh, but uh, it, yeah, looks like it's gonna still take a few more months uh, for all of us to see each other. Uh, so, with that said, I, I think that uh, it was definitely, uh, I mean, I, I'm also happy I don't have to travel uh, given the current circumstances. So, I, I hope that uh, we'll, we'll be able to get some uh, good science exchange today. Uh, and what I would say is that I'm not, not very used to giving uh, talks to a uh, clinical audience. I, I tried as much as possible to, uh, to make uh, this presentation uh, engaging, accessible uh, to everyone. But please, if there is anything at any point that doesn't make sense, unmute yourself, interrupt me. I'll try to monitor the chat, so feel free to post in the chat. I may not always see the, the chat being uh, lit up. So uh, really, don't be afraid to unmute yourself and, and tell me if you have any questions. All right, so with that said, I'm gonna start uh, this uh, grand round presentation on the molecular basis of Bartlett beetle syndrome. Uh, I'll start by telling you that I have no disclosure whatsoever. And the outline of this presentation is as follows. So I will start to give you a short history of uh, the ciliopathies, uh, some things that uh, I'm guessing many of you have heard, uh, but might be new to some. Um, the meat of this talk will be on Bartlett beetle syndrome, and this will be on uh, this journey from uh, the discovery of, of genes to the uh, unveiling of the molecular mechanism. Uh, and finally, 
I'd like to finish on what is a current topic in my lab, uh, which is the maintenance of the photoreceptor outer segment protein. So this is what I believe all of us are interested in and uh, live and breathe to understand uh, uh, and, uh, um, and improve, which is vision. How do we see things? And for us human, uh, seeing is one of is probably the most important uh, sensory function. We're we're lousy at hearing, at smelling, uh, but we're very good at seeing things. And so it's that our our brain uh, inputs are really dominated uh, by vision. And the way that vertebrates uh, see. Uh, is uh, thanks to the, the retina in the back of their eye. Uh, and if you look at the retina, it's the, the cell type that really receives uh, uh, photon and transduce, transduces them uh, is uh, the photoreceptor. The architecture of the photoreceptor started to get uh, described uh, in the 1950s, uh, in the golden age of electron microscopy. Uh, and Eddie de Robertis, the elder, his son is a famous embryologist, but Eddie de Robertis, an Argentinian electron microscopist, uh, uh, described in 1956 the structure of uh, that connected what he called the inner segment to the outer segment. And he was struck by the organization of the structure. And you, you can see here his, uh, his rendering of his results uh, in that uh, this, this connection between inner segment and outer segment uh, contains these bundles of microtubules. Okay, some things that had been hinted at, but he was really the first one to see it uh, with such precision. And that led him to realize that this entire outer segment of photoreceptor was a cilium. And a cilium is a structure that uh, you see on the surface of cells that projects from the surface of the cell. Uh, and that consists of a bundle of nine doublet microtubule. We call it the axonym. That's something, uh, a term I may uh, use today. Uh, and it is within a sheath of the ciliary membrane, uh, membrane that itself is continuous with the plasma membrane. Then at its base, uh, there is a structure that consists of a triplet now of microtubules. That's a basal bud. So here you go. That's uh, your run-of-the-mill primary cilium. And now that is your photoreceptor outer segment. And this structure, Eddie de Robertis named it the connecting cilium. But the important realization here is that the entire outer segment is the equivalent of a primary cilium. So cilia are things that you see on a variety of cell types. And you can see motile cilia for example, on your airway epithelia. They perform very important functions in innate immunity. If you need to fight uh, COVID particles that are getting in your airway, the first line of defense uh, is simply mucus moving, trapping these particles and moving them out of the airway. But it turns out that you also have primary cilia and these primary cilia are non-motile cilia. They don't have the structures, all these little um, elaborations here that, that you can see in these motile cilia cross section. They don't exist in primary cilia. So these primary cilia, they, they cannot move, but they're present on nearly every cell in your body. And, and here is a, a summary. You have them on olfactory receptor neuron, you have them on kidney cells, you have them on developing uh, ear cells, nearly every cell, uh, and in particular, every neuron has a primary cilia. But for the longest time, and this is taken from a book from the 1980s that was really a classic of uh, cell biology, uh, by Don Fawcett, who was the chair of cell biology at Harvard, uh, and this really gives you a sense of what the appreciation 
for primary cilia was at the time. And it was not even called primary cilia. In fact, it was called an aberrant solitary cilium. And for people like Don Fawcett, these things was absolutely beyond the scope of any scientific endeavor. Uh, there was nothing interesting about it. And the term uh, aberrant solitary cilia could be exchanged for an abortive cilium. It was literally some things that didn't even deserve to be on a cell. It's some things that probably was a remnant of evolution when all cells were moving around and give it a few million years and we should now lose it. So now you can fast forward to 2010 and uh, my former institution, uh, Stanford had a, a little magazine there uh, where now they were talking about the cell tower, the rise of the cell. So how did we get from Don Fawcett calling the cilium an abortive structure uh, to people talking about the cell tower of the uh, uh, cilium? Well, there are really two aspects that, that transformed our appreciation of the cilium. And the first one should be no surprise to any of you in the audience, it's that the cilium is important for signaling. And in particular, in the case of vision, that really forms a paradigm for how cilia uh, facilitate signaling. Um, you have the entire phototransduction cascade, all the way from the light sensing G protein coupled receptor rhodopsin down to the cyclic nucleotide gated channel that will change membrane polarization and transmit a hyperpolarization from this outer segment all the way to the inner segment and to the synaptic terminal so that now this cell can trigger the release of neurotransmitter that can be further interpreted within the brain. But this paradigm of cilia sensing the outer environment is not exclusive to photoreceptors. A very similar paradigm applies to olfactory receptor neurons, where again, you have a G protein coupled receptor. In this case, that's a GPCR that senses chemical. It's present on the surface of cilia in this olfactory receptor neuron, and it will instruct the entire olfactory transduction cascade down to, again, a cyclic nucleotide gated channel. Same principle applies, this cell is a neuron. Ultimately, the sensing of an odorant uh, triggers the release of, a, uh, uh, of synaptic um, uh, messengers. However, the, the breakthrough in our appreciation of the importance of cilia came from the work of Katherine Anderson in 2003, who through forward genetics in mice realized that hedgehog signal, which is a developmental pathway that patterns your limbs, patterns your neural tube, that this developmental pathway also required the primary cilia. And the reason there, the, the paradigm that was developed in photoreceptors that was developed in olfactory receptor neuron applies again in the cells that are transducing hedgehog. Um, and the paradigm is that you have signaling receptors that are present on the surface of cilia uh, and that transduce signal. There is a little twist there, however, and you can appreciate the twist here on this diagram in that uh, you have a dynamic organization of these signaling cascade. So you start out with a certain complement of signaling molecule. You have this receptor for hedgehog named patched one. You have a G protein couple receptor, GPR161. That's in the basal state. Once you activate the cascade, now you completely switch the complement of signaling molecule. And now you have a positive regulator of the pathway named smoothen that enters cilia. So now slight twist on the paradigm, but the important thing is that cilia 
organized signaling tasks. And that happens uh, in sensory signaling, in developmental signaling, it happens also in homeostatic signaling. Uh, so something that has broad physiological importance. The second reason why cilia started to become appreciated uh, as being important uh, uh, in uh, physiology and health and disease is because of the discovery of ciliopathies. This term ciliopathies was coined in 2006 by Nico Katsanis in a visionary review where he realized that a host of diseases with common symptoms likely all had their root cause in dysfunction of the primary cilia. The symptoms that are seen in ciliopathies uh, are kidney malformations, in particular kidney cyst, retinal degeneration, skeletal malformation, often manifesting um, as polydactyly, extra digits, extra toes. Um, frequently, you see obesity in, uh, in ciliopathy patients, uh, uh, and you can get uh, uh, heterotaxy, change of, uh, of body plan symmetry uh, to various extent. Um, you often get loss of the sense of smell and infertility. And really, by far, the vastest class of ciliopathies are the retinal ciliopathies. In almost every ciliopathy, you do see an indication of retinal degeneration. Overall, and here it's a, a, a diagram that's extracted from a, a review from four years ago. Um, we have now well over 120 different genes that cause at least 10 different diseases uh, uh, that are all enc encompassed under uh, this umbrella of ciliopathies. And the one ciliopathy that I became interested in now 15 years ago is Bardet Beetle syndrome. Uh, Bardet Beetle syndrome is the name for uh, two physicians, Georges Bardet, who was a medical student, in fact, at the uh, University of Paris. And uh, uh, so uh, patients who presented with obesity, polydactyly, and retinal degeneration. At the time, they didn't appreciate uh, the uh, kidney indication. Uh, and the, uh, the disease is named also for Arthur Beadle, uh, who is by many considered to be the father of modern endocrinology. And so these two gave the name to this disease, Bardet Beadle syndrome. So what is exactly Bardet Beadle syndrome? As I described to you, you have four cardinal uh, symptoms, retinal degeneration, polydactyly obesity, and kidney cyst. Uh, and I just wanted to say a few things about specifically the uh, uh, indication in the ophthalmology field. Um, what you see in patients is that you have, you start to detect ERG abnormalities at about five year old. And from that point on, uh, you have a rapid progression of the retinal degeneration that leads to blindness typically by age 15 or early. The, Progression of retinal degeneration is rather unusual compared to classic cases of retinitis pigmentosa in that you see a degeneration of cones either before or at the same time as rods. Uh, that's an autosomal recessive disorder. It's a very rare disease uh, in the American population. The frequency is one in 150,000 lifers. Uh, and it's genetically very heterogeneous. So this is something that was quite surprising uh, when the disease was, was first analyzed by human geneticists in that you don't have a handful of genes, you have over 20 different genes. There have been 21 that have been identified. There are likely many more uh, because they, they are about 20% of patients that do not have mutations uh, in known genes. And sadly, there is absolutely no treatment. When ophthalmologists see BBS patients, uh, the only thing that they can tell them is that the 
uh, vision will be lost uh, and that uh, they should prepare themselves for that. But at this point, there is really nothing we can do uh, to combat either the degeneration of the photoreceptor or obesity uh, in these patients. So telling you a little bit more about uh, retinal degeneration, and these are studies here uh, from mouse models. Uh, uh, and in this case, this is a BBS5 knockout, but pretty much all the BBS knockouts behave in exactly the same way. What you see is that at two months of age, uh, uh, you have compromised uh, rod photoreceptor function, but you still have some function of rod photoreceptor. However, for the cones, the cone function is almost completely absent. And again, this largely recapitulates the human disease. At the ultrastructural level, however, what you see is that these, um, these rods, even though they appear largely functional in ERG, ultrastructurally, they're a complete mess. And what you see there are these, instead of having these nice stacks of discs, you have these highly elongated ribbons um, so the disc, instead of nicely closing and being enclosed within the membrane of the outer segment, they just keep growing, uh, which, which gives rise to these long worlds of, uh, of discs. And you see a similar things in cones, uh, where again, you have hyper elongated disc, um, and, and they, instead of, of stacking in a normal plane, uh, to the uh, to the, the the axis of photoreceptor, uh, you see them oftentimes in a, a horizontal uh, parallel to the main axis uh, uh, position. So large ultrastructural defects and uh, uh, some clear defects at, at the functional level for cones, some milder defects for rods. Okay, so. Uh, the questions that I really was faced with when I, I started to get interested in bardet biddle syndrome uh, was how is this genetic heterogeneity, what does it correspond to at the molecular level? What is a molecular mechanism that underlies bardet biddle syndrome? I've been trained as a biochemist cell biologist, so, uh, for me, the problem and the way I, I was seeing this, uh, this problem that was that emerged from human genetics is really that genetics gave us a part to split. So genetics identified genes, which when defective gave rise to this disease. That's all the parts that makes the engine. So it, it told you about uh, a specific uh, M4 by 20 screw, uh, but it didn't really tell you what this specific component did. It didn't tell you how you went from this part list to a functioning molecular machine. And that was really the, the, the if you want, the, the detective work that was needed was to go from, here is a little screw that uh, we've identified to, there is a machine that this group functions in. The second uh, aspect that I, uh, I, I decided to, um, to leverage uh, was to work in cultured cells. And a lot of the work I'll present you today has been done uh, in cultured mammalian cells. And the reason for that is that cilia are present in cultured mammalian cells. And they're present in specific conditions, so cells in culture will cycle, they'll, they'll divide constantly if you give them the right nutrient. Um, but if you withdraw growth factors, cells enter what's called quiescence. So they, they enter a state that's not quite a dormant state. They're, they're there uh, waiting for growth factor to come in. This state of uh, quiescence is when cells start to grow cilium. And, and here you can see one such uh, instance of a cell in culture. And the cilium uh, is stained with this marker, acetylated tubulin, uh, and you can see the cilium is positioned uh, fairly close to the nucleus. So this is a type of system that I'll, I'll be presenting you uh, uh, data on uh, quite a bit today. Okay, so when I started working on BBS around 2005, 2007, 
uh, we had 11 BBS genes that had been identified by human geneticists. Uh, and really, none of these gene product gives you any idea about what the molecular basis of BBS could be. So the first thing that I did was to purify the protein complexes that these BBS uh, gene product uh, were components of. And that led to the discovery of this protein complex that I named the BBSome, and that contains eight different BBS proteins. So now this pushed the question one level further, which was, okay, what is this BBSome doing? Now we have a molecular entity that exists in the cell. Um, what does this molecular entity function in? Uh, and here, more biochemistry led to the realization that another BBS gene product, which is a product of the BBS3 gene, encodes for a protein that's named R6. And what this protein does is that it, it uh, binds to uh, nucleotides, to GTP and GDP. Uh, and when it is bound to GTP, it is able to recruit the BBSome to membranes. Okay. Uh, this, the, this, this product, the product of the BBSome recruitment to membrane, is the formation of uh, a coat of a polymer on the surface of membrane. So this realization that the BBSome forms a coat now gave us an idea, uh, which is that coat complexes uh, had been described by many uh, talented investigators, including the Nobel Prize winner, Randy Shekman, Jim Rothman. Uh, and these codes, their function in the cell is to move proteins from one compartment to another. And here you can see this diagram of the major codes uh, in the cell, uh, clathrin, COP1, COP2, and all these codes are gonna move protein from one compartment to another. So what was the BBSome code doing in cilia? There, what we found is that R6 and the BBSome uh, uh, are localized in little patches, okay, that are uh, flanking this microtubal axon. And our interpretation here is that these patches are, they, they correspond to polymers of BBSome and R6 that are uh, stuck, that, that are opposed to the membrane of the cell. Okay, so we also see, and that's not now by super resolution, but we could see that R6 and the BBSome uh, did co-localize in these discontinuities uh, along the primary cilia. Uh, one thing I should mention that's very important is that there are no vesicles inside the primary cell. So everything that I'll be describing in terms of movement of patches, movement of protein, this is always patches or proteins that are laterally moving or laterally uh, uh, stuck to the ciliary membrane. There are no little vesicles that are moving up and down. And speaking of movement, this is what I wanted to show you, which is that the BBSome, these BBSome patches, they are moving up and down within the cilium. And they are moving thanks to a system called intraflagellar transport or IFT uh, that was discovered by Joel Rosenbaum in the late 1990s. And that's a system uh, that uh, encompasses a, a, I mean, a couple of large protein complexes and molecular motors. So there you have it, you have, a, you have these little machines, these microtubule motors that are moving these IFT BBSome trains, uh, is what they're called in the field, up and down inside uh, the primary cell. Okay, so now we, we had understood some of the cell biology of the BBSome, but the question is, what's it really moving? What are the cargoes that the BBSOBE code is moving? And here, what we discovered is that the BBSOBE recognizes some of the cytoplasmic determinant of 
the signaling receptors that are localized to celiac. And in particular, in this case, this receptor uh, named GPR161 that is responsive to Hedgehog. And um, what had been described by Saikat Mukopadai and Peter Jackson is that GPR161, uh, and, and you see that in cultured cells here, uh, it exits cilia when the hedgehog pathway is activated. So here you have the merge. And here what I did was just to shift the channel between the cilia marker acetylated tubulin and GPR161 ever so slightly so that you can well appreciate the green uh, uh, signal being present here uh, in untreated cells and disappearing once the cells are stimulated. These signal dependent exits of the GPCR GPR161 no longer happened when either R6 or BB zone function is compromised. So there you have it. That is now what we understand as being Z function of the BB zone, which is in the signal dependent exit of signaling receptor from CIL. And this is something that Fannier, uh, who was a postdoc in the lab, was able to directly visualize uh, at the single molecule level. So here what Fan did was to use a quantum dot, so a very bright fluorescent entity that he coupled to a single molecule of GPR161 in the cilium. And he could visualize the movement of this single molecule of GPR161 diffusing, then rapidly moving back to the base and then exiting cilia. So this really is the basis. Sorry. Here, um, this is the basis of the, the model that I'm giving you here, um, which is that when signaling receptor in the cilium get activated, they become recognized by the BB zone, uh, and the BB zone forms this coat that become coupled to this intraflagellar transport train that move from the tip to the base of the cilium and ferry these molecules, these signaling receptors outside of the cilia. So that really leads now to a, a more general model for bardet biddle syndrome, which is that most of the symptoms that are observed in BBS patients are caused by defects in removing signaling receptors from cilia. And there are many signaling receptors that we now know are in cilia that need to function in cilia and that probably need to exit cilia in order for signaling reaction to be properly propagated. However, in the case of retinal degeneration, there wasn't such an obvious signaling receptor that needed to exit cilia uh, via the BBZO mediated pathway. So what is the function of the BBZO in photoreceptors? Did, did all this work that was done in cell culture, in model organism, give us insights about what the function of the BBZO was in photoreceptors? And, and here, I'm showing you the entire phototransduction cascade just to indicate that within this, uh, this cascade, um, none of the membrane proteins are undergoing signal dependent exit. Rhodopsin never exit the cilium to go back to the inner segment. And no other membrane protein is known to go from the outer segment back to the inner segment. So what exactly can the BB zone do in this cell type? And here I need to present you the foundational work of Songjin Seo at the University of Iowa, who conducted a heroic purification of outer segment from BBS mice and compared them to wild type mice. And what you could see by doing the proteomic analysis is that there were over a hundred proteins that accumulated in the outer segment of these BBS mutant mice. And what he proposed is that the flux of rhodopsin that's going from its place of synthesis in the inner segment to its place of function, the outer segment, 
this tremendous flux of synthesis that's been estimated to be as high as 1,000 rhodopsin per second in frog photoreceptors, this flux of rhodopsin is going to be like the Niagara Falls. It carries every little rock and uh, grain of sand from the upstream location into the downstream location. So that accidentally you get proteins that belong to the inner segment that accidentally enter the outer segment. And here is one such instance in this protein syntax in three, um, which uh, in Song Jin work was shown to uh, accumulate in the outer segment of BBS photoreceptors. So this now leads to the following model, which is that in photoreceptors, what the bibisome does is not to remove proteins on demand as it does in other cell type, it's to remove protein constitutively, is to remove what I call pollutant, things that don't belong to the outer segment, but that accidentally get into the outer segment. So this gives you a uh, now unifying theory, if you want, of, of BBS, which is that the bibisome's job is to remove unwanted proteins from cilia. But one question that remained unanswered is how are these unwanted proteins specifically recognized as being unwanted and as being prospective bibisome cargoes? How does the bibisome know which protein to remove and which protein to leave behind in the ceiling? And here, a few years back, we started to think about this post-translational modification named ubiquitin. Ubiquitin is a 76 amino acid polypeptide. It's a, a very small protein. And it's a protein that becomes attached to substrates. And it's become attached to an isopeptide bond uh, onto lysine residues. What's fascinating about ubiquitin is that it is not, uh, it, it, it's not simply that you attach a ubiquitin, you're done with it. You can form chains of ubiquitin and these different chains are completely different. So you don't have just one flavor of ubiquitin, you have an entire code of ubiquitin modification. And depending on the specific linkage that's formed when these chains are elongated and here, I just show you that on ubiquitin itself, um, uh, there are two lysines that are highlighted. But if one of the lysines is picked, lysine 48, that targets proteins to this degradative machine called the proteasome. That is a multi-protease machine that will chop off polypeptides uh, that need to be digested. Uh, but if you choose another lysine, which is now lysine 63, now that gets a membrane protein to be targeted to the lysosome. And I'm just showing you two functions here. There are myriads of functions. There are uh, seven different linkages. So there is a very rich complexity to ubiquitin modification. But there were a few indications that ubiquitin may function in cilia which led Swapnil Shinde, a postdoc in the lab, to investigate ubiquitin in our system. And here what Swapnil is looking at is a G-protein coupled receptor, uh, the somatostatin receptor 3. We express that in our cultured cells. And what we see, and again, the signals here are shifted for ease of visualization, but you see in science that you have the somatostatin receptor 3 in cilia, and you add its ligand, somatostatin, and it now disappears from cell. So again, like I showed you earlier, classic case of signal dependent exit. You do the same experiment in a cell where bibisome function is compromised. And you see two things. You see that the science signal doesn't exit cilia. And you see that as this frustrated exit is getting uh, uh, stuck in, in cilia, uh, you see now an appearance in yellow of ubiquitin signal in cilia. 
Now, what I can tell you is that based on biochemical study, we know that these ubiquitins are attached to SSTR3, are attached to this GPCR that cannot exit cilia. In addition, what Swep Neal figured out is that this ubiquitin signal is specifically in the form of lysine 63 linked ubiquitin chains, which are the chains that are important for lysosomal degradation. So that gave Swepnil an ID, um, an A model, which is that this ubiquitin, this lysine 63 linked ubiquitin chains become added to activated GPCR in cilia, and they provide a signal for the bibisome to recognize the proteins that it should be selecting for removal from cilia. So that these proteins can now get attached to the bibisome and ferried out of the cell. So based on this hypothesis, what Swepnil proposed is that he should be able to introduce inside the cilium some molecular scissors that cleave this lysine 63 linked ubiquitin chain. And uh, this is a, these molecular scissors, uh, they belong to a class of enzymes that are called D-ubiquitinases. They are proteases that cleave uh, ubiquitin linkages. And there is one such D-ubiquitinase that is exquisitely specific for the lysine 63 linkage. So when we target this D-ubiquitinase to cilia, uh, and here is just the control I'm showing you, Again, shifted channels, uh, just to show you that uh, when we transfect this, this dummy construct into cells, we are getting normal exit of SSTR3, uh, even though this dummy protein is entering cilia. Same experiment now with the lysine 63 specific D ubiquitinase. Now what you see is this D ubiquitinase is in cilia and this GPCR no longer can undergo signal dependent exit from cilia. We've done the same experiment with other bibisome cargos, other GPCR, smoothen, GPR161. Same result. This D ubiquitinase completely blocks dependent exit, uh, uh, bibisome, uh, sorry, signal dependent exit of bibisome cargos. So there you have it. That's the major conclusion, which is that these lysine 63 linked ubiquitin chains, they're required for exit of bibisome cargoes from cell. So this leads to uh, the following models that I, I'm showing you here. Data I didn't present you and something you, you may have been wondering about is how are these lysine 63 ubiquitin chains added specifically onto the activated signaling receptor. Well, here there is a little um, molecular adapter that's named beta restin 2 that is able to recognize the conformation of the activated signaling receptor. And um, we believe that beta restin 2 recruits a what's called the ubiquitin ligase, so an enzyme that adds ubiquitin chains specifically onto these activated receptors. Uh, and I, I should mention that another group, Greg Pazur, has published similar finding, uh, findings together with us. So again, we had now a model that we had uh, arrived at from studies in cell culture. But the question was, how does that apply to photoreceptor? We, again, we don't have signal dependent exits in photoreceptors. So, are these lysine 63 linked ubiquitin chains also used in photoreceptors? And here uh, I'm going to present you some unpublished work from a student in the lab, uh, Shri Das, who started to become interested in the function of ubiquitin in photoreceptors. And so here she's looking in this retinal section, and uh, you can see that the layer of outer segment. Uh, there is no real detectable signal for ubiquitin. However, when she does the same experiment in a BBS knockout animal, 
what she can now see is a massive accumulation of ubiquitin signal in this outer segment layer. And as you might expect from the work that we've done in cell culture, this ubiquitin signal is in the form of lysine 63 linked ubiquitin chain. That's what you can see here with this reagent that she's using to specifically de detect lysine 63 linked ubiquitin chains. Um, you have a massive accumulation of signal in the outer segment of BBS knockout animals. Um, all of that is done fairly early at P15, uh, before the onset of retinal degeneration. Uh, in fact, she can even see accumulation of ubiquitin signal in the outer segment as early as P8. So as soon as there is an outer segment that forms, it seems that you already have ubiquitinated proteins that accumulate in the outer segment of these BBS knockout mice. So the next question that we wanted to answer is what are these ubiquitinated proteins that are accumulating in the outer segment of these BBS uh, uh, mutant animals? And so here, Shri uh, uh, bravely uh, decided to undertake a biochemical purification of these ubiquitinated proteins. And the schema uh, is on paper very simple, which is that you take this mutant retina, you purify the outer segments, and then you use a reagent that's called a tube, tandem ubiquitin binding entity. So it's a, uh, an engineered uh, protein that specifically recognizes uh, ubiquitin chains. And so you, you get different tubes. You can have tubes that recognize all chains. In this case, we have a tube that is specific for lysine 63 linked ubiquitin chain. Okay, so this tube, then she can, with that, purify the ubiquitinated proteins that are present in outer segments. Um, and here is just to show you that indeed these tubes, uh, uh, when you take uh, these, um, uh, these outer segment uh, uh, homogenates, um, the tubes can purify ubiquitinated proteins. And they're seen as a smear because these ubiquitin chains are of such varied lengths between different proteins that you, you do not see discrete species, uh, but rather a smear. But the important thing is that the smear is present at a much higher level in the BBS knockout than in the wild type animals, which fits very nicely with our immunohistochemistry. So the next step was then to do proteomics on uh, these, these proteins, these ubiquitinated proteins that Shri had discovered. That's something we did in collaboration with the lab of Marianne Kaloxai at Harvard Medical School. Um, and what we found is that there were about, and depending where we set the threshold, but with fairly stringent threshold, we find 36 proteins that are enriched in BBS knockout photoreceptor outer segments. Um, the vast majority of them are membrane proteins. And most of them are proteins that are known to reside in the inner segment, in some part of the inner segment. The largest category are proteins that are proteins either in synaptic vesicles or synaptic terminal. Um, we also get transporters, ion transporter, amino acid transporters that are known to exist within the membrane, the plasma membrane of the inner segment. Uh, we also get some adhesion molecules. Uh, but here, again, taking the example of just one such protein we identify in taxin three. Um, there, the model uh, is that in taxin three accidentally enters the outer segment, gets recognized by the ubiquitination machinery, which add a, adds a lysine 63 linked ubiquitin chains onto this foreign protein. And now, this ubiquitinated protein can be recognized by the BBSOME and the IFT machinery to go back into the inner segment. Uh, indeed, we find that syntaxin 3, uh, here the asterisk is just to denote a, a non specific band, but syntaxin 3, which migrates here, you can see that it is enriched in 
this tube eluid, this, this uh, uh, ubiquitinated uh, proteins, uh, uh, specifically in the BBS outer segment. And, and you can see higher molecular weight species, which may correspond to ubiquitinated forms of syntax in uh, And this fits very nicely with what Song Jin Seo had discovered, which is that syntaxin 3 in BBS knockout animals accumulates in the outer segment. So there you have it. The conclusion we have is it's these lysine 63 ubiquitin chains in photoreceptor, they mark the unwanted non cellular protein that are to be removed and redirected back to the inner segment. So I want to leave you with one take home message uh, for today, which is that the bibisome is part of a machinery for quality control of the proteome of cilia. And that's either in cilia of kidney cells, of neuron, photoreceptor, any cells that has a cilia. And this quality control can take different form. It can be an on-demand control of the ciliary proteome when the signaling receptor no longer should be in cilia, when it is instructed to exit cilia because it is getting activated. The bibisome there will do its job to remove uh, this ubiquitinated signaling receptor. But it also does a job of a uh, just housekeeping of vacuum cleaning the cilium, removing proteins that don't belong to the cilium uh, that are also getting ubiquitinated and that are getting constitutively cleared from cilia. So the conclusions uh, uh, for you today uh, that I hope I convey is that the cilium is really a point of convergence for a range of hereditary disorder with several characteristic features. The bimisome uh, really, and, and its function of uh, quality control, uh, uh, it forms a unifying uh, mechanism for BBS. Uh, uh, and the failure uh, to control the quality of the ciliary proteome uh, uh, can either lead to specific signaling defects, or it can lead to more general architectural defects in photoreceptors uh, that lead to a disorganization of the outer segment and ultimately to the death of photoreceptors. Uh, and finally, the uh, uh, part that's uh, the most current uh, part of our work is that the bibisome sorts ubiquitinated protein out of cilia. And, uh, and, and uses uh, the slicing 63 ubiquitin chains to recognize its specific cargoes. And with that, I will thank uh, the group. I acknowledge the people who did the work today, Swap Neil Shinde, Sri Das. Uh, none of the work would have been possible without uh, our founders, uh, in particular RPB and NIH who, found, who funded the work uh, that I presented today. Uh, and with that, I will be ready for your questions. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry, I can't seem to hear you. Let me see what's going on. Can you hear me now, Dr. Nachuri? Now I can, yes. Okay, um, so, so for not giving a lot of uh, talks to clinicians, you did a wonderful job uh, <laughs> telling that story, allowing uh, us to follow along. You know, I was really Thank interested you. in the concept of this large flux of rhodopsin bringing along uh, un unwanted, you know, proteins. Uh, are there other physiologic models for that, that that you're aware of, where again you have this large flux and now you need this um, quality control mechanism to to take things back? I've not not heard of that. Mm. 
Yeah, that's a, a great question. I mean, what, what other instance uh, could one see? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm thinking, I mean, uh, uh, you know, so the so, so <laughs> classic um, uh, example mm -hmm. of tremendous trafficking flux uh, is the plasma cell, so an activated B lymphocyte that really becomes remodeled to uh, uh, secrete uh, IgGs. Uh, but yeah, in this case, I, I can't think of anything that the cell does uh, to to counteract this, this tremendous, tremendous flux. So yeah, that's a good question, actually. I, I haven't thought about that in, in other instances than photoreceptors. Well, thank you. I have a question. <clears throat> yes, Wolfgang. I, you said the bibisome moves by IFT in primary cilia. How about photoreceptor and auto segment? It is not clear to me how it moves around. Is it IFT or is it some other mechanism? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, obviously all this work we've done to image the movement in life cells is all done in cell culture. I don't know of such work that's been done in mm -hmm. photoreceptors, I, I believe would be technically exceedingly challenging. Uh, so I, I don't know. I'm actually, yeah, maybe you know uh, what happens to the bibisome in dynein uh, uh, mutant uh, retina. Well, we, we know that rhodopsin moves to the outer segment and we have a paper published that does not use IFT, but that's controversial. Some people believe, like David Williams, that it clearly is IFT, and we say it happens by diffusion. So that's a big question, and the outer segment doesn't really have a long axon. Even. It doesn't go to the very tip like in primary cilia. Mm -hmm. and we believe tubulin is transported by IFT, but rhodopsin is not. So the question really is, nobody knows how BBS, the BBS home is moving about. It could be dynein too, as a molecular motor and retrograde transport, but it's not really clear. So um, you, do you have any answer on this? <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I really, I mean, in, in photoreceptors, uh, I, I do not. I mean, that's. Uh, I, I think that's a very important question. But uh, yeah, one that we we haven't really looked at again. That that's something we've only looked at in cell culture. So, so our research concludes that photoreceptor outer segments are primary cilia, but they're different from primary cilia, and they have <laughs> different mechanisms. So that's our research, and we talk about this uh, at eleven o'clock. <laughs> Sounds good. I'm looking forward to it. I don't see any other questions, and we are at time. I uh, do just want to, again, thank you. Uh, for anyone that is interested, there is the Noon Research Seminar. Uh, please just email uh, Megan Johnson or, or Julie, and uh, we can get you that link if you're uh, able and interested for any of the clinicians. Uh, again, thank you. We uh, also wish you were here. Uh, it's a beautiful blue sky day and uh, no, no doubt, uh, hope, hope we can host you at some point. So uh, thank you again. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.